This is a mechanism of disease map for Crohn's disease. I'll be talking about the etiology of Crohn's disease, as well as the pathophysiology and how that leads into the manifestations of the disease. As with all of these flowcharts, these mechanism of disease maps, they are color coded according to the core concepts listed in this legend up here. This is the entire map, so take a screenshot if you like, and I'll, go, I'll be going through all of this one by one. So again, I'll be starting with the etiology here on the left, and then the rest of the slide will be pathophysiology to manifestations. Now the main central pathophysiology mechanism for Crohn's disease is that there is dysregulation of cellular and cytokine immune inflammatory response. The cellular response includes leukocytes and neutrophils, and the cytokine response includes TNF and interferon. That's tumor necrosis factor and IFN. Now, there's a little bit more detail here. It's not very important to know, but in general, you have faulty IL-23 signaling with Th17, which leads to unrestrained Th17 cell function, and that's what leads to inflammation. But we'll kind of be talking about the downstream effects of this dysregulated inflammatory response. But first, let's go into the etiologies. First, there's a genetic predisposition to Crohn's disease in some people. It's thought to be the NOD2 protein mutation, that's nucleus, uh, sorry, nucleotide oligo oligomerization binding domain 2, and that's an HLA-B27 association. So because there's that genetic predisposition, you'll have the disease aggregate in families. It doesn't necessarily follow a strict hereditary pattern, but people in the same families tend to have Crohn's disease. In addition, tobacco smoke, smoking makes it worse. And there are sometimes environmental or microbial triggers that either start someone off on having the disease or exacerbate the disease. The uh, environment or microbes, like infections, can be responsible for flares in Crohn's disease for people who have it. So that's the etiology. Now let's start talking about how the disease manifests itself. And sometimes talking about the manifestations requires discussing more of the pathophysiology. First, from a histology perspective, the characteristic finding is non-caseating granulomas. You might also see giant cells and lymphoid aggregates, but the one to remember is non-caseating granulomas for Crohn's disease. On, endo on endoscopy, you'll see skip lesions. You might also see segmental or a discontinuous pattern. This segmental discontinuous pattern is in contrast to ulcerative colitis, and there will be another mechanism of disease map for that. You might also see the cobblestone sign in Crohn's disease. Now in Crohn's disease, you have this genetic regulation problem. You have altered expression of function of epithelial membrane ion channels and transporters. This results in decreased water and ion absorption in the gut, which can lead to diarrhea. And the diarrhea is typically chronic in nature. The patient will have it for weeks to months to years. It's not one episode of diarrhea. This is a recurring problem. In addition, because you have all of this unnecessary inflammation, the body will show a low-grade fever. This inflammation also causes damage to the body, so you'll have local tissue damage. So the edema um, and erosions can lead to ulcers and necrosis of the bowel. The typical location, and this is also typically seen on endoscopy, is the terminal ileum and the colon, and usually it spares the rectum. So again, I'm mentioning the discontinuous pattern here, and most of this is in contrast to um, ulcerative colitis. Usually ulcerative colitis might affect the, uh, the, the rectum, but here you'll have terminal ileum definitely affected. Um, rectum is definitely not affected in Crohn's disease. This local tissue damage, these ulcers and this necrosis, can, when it, they get really bad, lead to obstruction, fibrotic scarring, stricture, and strangulation of the bowel. Now, when you have this kind of scarring inside the bowel, the lumen gets smaller and smaller, and you have a stricture, and you're not able to pass things through it. So that can lead to constipation. So um, it's, it's usually diarrhea to begin with for the long course of the illness, but they can have little bouts of constipation as well if they have obstruction, scarring, and strictures. You might also feel a right lower quadrant mass on physical exam for patients with Crohn's disease. Another thing that characterizes Crohn's disease is that you have transmural inflammation. So these ulcers go all the way through the wall of the bowel. 
Because you have transmural inflammation, the sinus tracts inside the bowel can entrap bacteria. Of course, it's normal to have tons of bacteria in your gut, but when you have this level of inflammation, the bacteria can sneak down into the little uh, pores of the gut, the little sinus tracts, and they can get caught, and they can create an abscess as the bacteria continues to grow. All of this mechanism together, the abscess, the transmural inflammation, the local tissue damage, the ulcers, the necrosis, they can cause the bowel to adhere to other organs uh, or even to the skin. And this can cause a perforation of the bowel into other structures. Now this is um, a, a later complication. Usually a patient won't present with this, but if the inflammation is bad and if it's been there for long enough, the, uh, and, and, and if it's usually untreated in these patients, you can have a perforation into other structures. And when that happens, it's called a fistula. And again, you can have a, a fistula from your gut to your skin. You can have a fistula between your gut and your bladder. And you can even have a fistula between two segments of gut, between loops of gut. There are some characteristic symptoms of this. One is pneumaturia, which means air in the urine. So the patient will literally be peeing out air in addition to their urine. And sometimes that air will have a foul smell. And that makes sense because it's air, it's, it's essentially flatulence that's passing through the urine. It's air from the gut that's getting into the bladder through a fistula and they're peeing it out. Of course, you have so much bacteria in your gut, um, as we mentioned when talking about the abscess, that when you have a fistula between your gut and your bladder, you can have recurrent ATIs. You're essentially seeding your bladder with bacteria from your gut. So those would be um, other signs and symptoms for patients that have a bowel bladder fistula from Crohn's disease. In addition, the errant inflammation of Crohn's disease causes mucosal cellular damage with loss of epithelial tight junctions. When you lose these tight junctions, you're not really able to retain water and solutes in your body. So you're going to be leaking water, solutes, and antigens into the GI lumen. This is another factor that can exacerbate your diarrhea in Crohn's disease. In addition, when you have this cellular damage, when you lose these tight junctions, the patient's going to feel pain. They'll have stimulation of visceral and parietal pain receptors in the gut. And the pain is, of course, transmitted to your central nervous system and processed, and they'll feel abdominal pain. It's usually a constant pain, and it's typically in the right lower quadrant. Um, similar to where you might find a mass in a patient that has a stricture or strangulation or scarring of the bowel. Now these two things together, the diarrhea and the abdominal pain, might lead to food avoidance. Um, the patient might present with anorexia, they might be afraid to eat because they know that they have pain and diarrhea when they do eat. That's not uncommon for these patients. In addition, because you have this mucosal cellular damage and the loss of epithelial tight junctions, the patient will have malabsorption. This kind of makes sense. You're like leaking stuff into your gut. Your gut is all kinds of damaged. The patient won't be able to absorb the nutrients that they do consume. Between this anorexia, food avoidance, and malabsorption, the patient might be losing weight um, when they are originally diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And of course, when you have this malabsorption, you have damage in your gut, you're going to be bleeding quite a lot too. This isn't like a non-bloody damage. So you can have chronic blood loss in the gut. Now this is intentionally written in small letters. Typically in Crohn's disease, you have non-bloody stools. That's the um, usual presentation. It is possible to have bloody stools in Crohn's disease, and you will have some blood loss through the gut. So you might be able to detect blood on an exam, but you usually don't have grossly bloody stools. And if you do have bloody stools, it's typically less than you would find in ulcerative colitis. So I wanted to put this here, but I also wanted to say that disclaimer, that typically Crohn's has non-bloody stools, but it is possible to bleed, and it is possible to detect um, blood in the stools for Crohn's disease. In any case, this chronic blood loss will lead to anemia um, through a number of mechanisms. First, of course, if you're bleeding into your gut, even if it's small amounts over a long amount of time, the patient can become anemic. You're malabsorbing your foods, you're bleeding, you're eventually going to have iron deficiency. So that can be the pattern of anemia um, that, that you show in Crohn's disease. And if somebody is anemic, it's not surprising if they are fatigued, if they are weak. This inflammatory response is a systemic problem. So you'll have this systemic release of cytokines, and that can affect other parts of the body, and it can also manifest in some of these symptoms. 
as well. When you have systemic cytokine release, you'll have decreased erythropoietin production, which results in decreased bone marrow function. This is yet another factor that can contribute to the anemia. Not only are you losing blood, not only are you iron deficient, but you're also now decreasing EPO production. You're actually making less blood to replace what you've lost. In addition, these cytokines have an inflammatory effect on the central nervous system, so the patient will actually be feeling bad sometimes when they eat, sometimes at baseline. So they'll have anorexia, they'll have nausea, vomiting, they can also have pain, as we mentioned here as well. So this is yet another factor that leads to weight loss in these patients. And all of this inflammation also has a long-term effect. It does put the patient at risk for cancer, and that's usually a small intestine cancer, but this can also cause a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and colon cancer as well. There's kind of two problems here that can lead to cancer. One is the inflammation that is the central uh, mechanism, the central pathophysiology of Crohn's disease. But the other problem is that to treat Crohn's disease, you usually use immunosuppressants, and that can also predispose patients to cancer, unfortunately. Lastly, for this map, it's worth mentioning that when you have systemic inflammation, you often have manifestations throughout the body. So these are the extra-intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease. I've listed some of them here. I'll read through them briefly. On the skin, you might have pyoderma gangrenosum or erythema nodosum. In the eyes, you can have uveitis or episcleritis. In the mouth, you can have amphitus stomatitis, which are these ulcers in the mouth. The joints can have peripheral arthritis or spondylitis. In your kidneys, you can have stones, nephrolithiasis, specifically calcium oxalate stones and you can have cholelithiasis as well. So that's it for this mechanism of disease map for Crohn's disease. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.